So these words from the gospel, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now later, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, thinking about the, the eye and the hand and sort of the, the, the depth of this moral teaching, we are kind of, what, wow, you know, it's one of those texts that if you conclude with, uh, cut off your right hand, and then this is the gospel of the Lord, it's kind of a non sequitur, right? Oh, that's pretty harsh. Well, how are we to take it? Not literally. All right, kids who are watching, all right, not literally. That means don't do that. Is the key to take it all as a word picture figuratively, or is the answer actually in the gospel of Christ? And so our title, Missing Members. Missing Jesus? Now Martin Luther in the first article of the Catechism said, the Father has given us in his creative work our body and soul, eyes, ears, and all our members, our reason and our senses, and still preserves them. So a member. We read a book in our book club a while ago at Christ about being a true member of the congregation. In the Bible, a member, as Paul defined it with respect to the church, was not a card carrier of some kind. It was literally a hand or foot, an ear or an eye. If an ear says, I'm not an eye, so I'm not part of the body, in Corinthians, that's membership. We're connected under the headship of Christ, like a body, in the church too. Our Lord is saying there's a connection here, not only with respect to an eye or a hand and cutting it off, but membership together in the body of Christ. Now bear with me. First of all, our Lord is saying that if you believe truly that sin is superficial, it's more on the surface, that a hand is really the source of if it's going to cause you to sin, then go ahead and cut it off. And we'll see how that works for you. Really, it's the classic Jewish argument, argument from absurdity. If we followed it literally, we wouldn't have the tools to cut more off eventually. Sin is deeper than an appendage. Sin lurks in the old nature heart. And so as our Lord reviews the commandments, not suggestions, the rules or demands of God, he goes deeper. You've heard of old, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not swear. These remind us, I think, that, uh, you know, what we have here is a summation of our Lord's sermon. He probably chose other commandments along the way, too, as he repeated this stump sermon. All of the Ten Commandments are important. Um, yeah, I do give you credit, by the way, on the tablets of stone. If you have it correct, three and then the rest on the other side. But the listing here is just partial. We get the idea that it's to be all-inclusive with respect to our neighbor. And then, of course, right? The throne of God, it all relates to God in the first three commandments as well. Jesus came not to set aside the law, but to fulfill the law and the prophets, he says in this sermon. 
And he gives a more demanding interpretation of the commandments of God. He shows that all evil thoughts, hatred, lust in the heart, taking God's name in vain, or where he's seated in our worshipful hearts, are spiritually destructive. It's all sin. And it comes from the outside, manifesting. It comes from the inside, manifesting itself in our members. So the Lord isn't counseling for cutting off appendages, for missing those members. What God is doing is calling us to an honest assessment of ourselves inside, that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one's off the hook. And I think, too, as he's selecting various things, he's also pointing to, in our own natures, where we're especially susceptible to temptation. Our own Achilles heel. Some of us are competitive in our natures. We just are. And godly ambition is absolutely fine. We know we sometimes take it too far. In our spirits, we make comparisons. We think we're all that. And so when someone wrongs us, oh man, we have a hard time saying we're sorry, grudges, hatred. The Lord would say murder in the spirit results. Some of us have a problem with lust. As the kids say, we're always on on. Yeah. I, how about it, Joanne, as a, a vicar and a young pastor, you're working very much with young people. And parents expect you to have the talk with the kids about sexual purity, right? And every time I had to talk with the kids, and I still remember the last one with how many kids were there, maybe 25 or 30 kids. We had just played Bible trivia, and we found a mistake in the Bible trivia. We wrote into them, by the way, and they corrected us, and they gave us credit for that correction. Later on, in that same meeting, I'm sitting, and I get to talk, and it was true. In every group of youth where you give that talk, there are three types of kids. One kid is like, why are we talking about this again? This is not an issue. There's another kid that say, he can't be serious. <laughs> And there's another that's saying, it's too late for me. All of us. All three. Others of us have a hard time with truth and controlling our tongues. You name it. We all have a weakness. It kind of reminds me of a news story I saw online this past week. It was on Yahoo. And uh, Greg Wenner, apparently he's a, some kind of journalist, reported that he, he found an Atlanta, Georgia man, quote, was arrested for allegedly using a broken window at the DeKalb County Jail to deliver items like narcotics, tobacco, cell phones, and chicken wings. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm thinking about the chicken wings. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we all have something. I, you know, we talked in, in Bible study about various sins, and, and I think someone mentioned gluttony. I thought, well, I only ate a lot of chicken wings today. We have to be careful in ourselves and with each other that we don't castigate the others, calling out their sin above our own. A number of years ago, in the 60s and 70s, I believe that this was done when marriages dissolved in Lutheran congregations. A lot of churches closed their doors to divorced people. They did. My former congregation, where I retired from, did not. In fact, on the South Side, it was known as the Divorced Church. I kid you not. People talked about it that way. Well, when I got the call to serve there, I talked with Pastor Lettergaard who had served there for many, many, many years through that period of time. And I, 
I just, just, you know, he said, you know, Ray, I know. I took a lot of heat those days. I did. He said, it wasn't about softballing sin. It was about souls looking for Jesus in the midst of real brokenness in their life. And it was about me as a pastor, as an under-shepherd, not Jesus himself, being honest with myself and not so judgmental with fellow sinners. I've learned in counseling people that when there is a divorce, nobody walks away with hands fully clean. You know, right? You, you read this and you say, well, does, does God leave anybody off the hook? My joke is, at least with the lust thing, the women are left off the hook, at least most of them, right? Because, you know, we, we understand. Nobody's off the hook. It's important to step back. I read a joke recently in the Reader's Digest, and it's time to lighten it up, you know, do it. Dixie Richardson wrote in, friends of ours announced they were getting divorced, and I was shocked. I don't get it, I said to my husband. They're so compatible. My husband shrugged wisely and said, I guess they have irreconcilable similarities. <laughs> well, those are things we're guessing, right? We don't know, brothers and sisters. But we know Jesus is still here even when we're tempted to alienate, tempted to lop off members. But in this case, 1 Corinthians 12, members of the church who seek to gather under his headship. The resolution for all of us is only Jesus and more Jesus recognize and repent of our helplessness personally. And in this repentance, recognize our desperate needs, all of us, for grace and mercy. To cry, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. It's kind of like the words of prayer from Thursday. The writer talks about his mom saying, you know, Jesus is perfectly right. And uh, they were reading a devotion at dinner and Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone. She said, Jesus is right. Sometimes it needs gravy. <laughs> well, gravy is her favorite condiment, if you read that. But he goes on to draw a contrast that Jesus is always right, and there's never anything more that we need to add to him. It's like Paul in the struggle in Romans 7. By the way, his struggle I'll read the last part of it. Starts with an illustration from marriage. That's how the chapter starts. I believe Paul, as a Pharisee, was married at one time. I don't know how that marriage dissolved, but I think they're, well, we'll see when we get to heaven. I find this law at work later on, he says. I want to do good, but evil is right there with me. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but see another law at work in me, waging war. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who gives to me the victory in Christ our Lord and Savior. That, the victory part comes in 1 Corinthians 15. As we repent and enter, well, after next week, transfiguration, I won't be with you, the season of Lent, it is time to look into our inner self, the battle between inner death and inner life in Christ. To look at our own Achilles heel, honestly, and to bring it to the Lord. And as we bring it to the Lord, and there is more Jesus, our Lord will move us with love, that isn't rocking back on the heels, but is more on the toes. Love saying, hey, I'm sorry, but I know the grace of God, and that grace is there for you as well. Missing members, missing Jesus. In the name of
name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.